Hello and welcome to Enlightened Empaths, your community for the spiritually awakened, where we discuss, explore, and connect with fellow empaths, healers, intuitives, and seekers. We are so excited to introduce to you all a man maybe some of you have already heard from because he has several very well-known popular podcasts. I'm talking about Thomas Miller, who's the author of Fear Buster and Subconscious Mind Mastery Science of Getting Rich, which is coming out soon. He also hosts the podcast Subconscious Mind Mastery, Fun Astrology, and Old Soul, New Soul with Robert Glasscock. Thomas Miller is a broadcast writer, content creator, and a traveler. He fell in love with broadcasting as a kid and would watch TV with a makeshift microphone made from the center of a roll of paper towels with aluminum foil stuffed around one end and act like a TV announcer. By 19, he was working in radio, and at 21, he was anchoring the 6 and 10 p.m. news at an ABC affiliate TV station in Fayetteville, Arkansas, while a senior in college. He started a television production business in Dallas, where he worked on national broadcast programming for CBS, the Nashville Network, ESPN, and others. Today, as I mentioned, he's the writer of Fear Busters, which came out in 2016 to address subconscious reprogramming of fear, something that grips everyone at some point in their lives. And as I said, coming soon is Subconscious Mind Mastery Science of Getting Rich, which is his take on the 1910 classic that has been the foundation of so many shifting their entire paradigm, including around money. He has also narrated over 33 audiobooks for author Fred Dodson on iTunes and Audible and five books for internationally recognized astrology expert Stephen Forrest. He found his own heaven in 2022 by accident when a podcast listener was intuitively prompted to see if he would house it for a couple of sibling tabby cats. He did, and in the process, found the western North Carolina mountains, where he now lives in a cabin in the woods not far from the Blue Ridge Parkway, Smoky Mountain National Park, and the Appalachian Trail. And he's on our show today to discuss the power of our subconscious mind. So thank you so much for joining us, Thomas. It's just a pleasure to have you on Enlightened Empaths. I wonder if you could start us off by telling listeners... A little bit about your journey to get to your podcast, Subconscious Mind Mastery, because I found it such an inspiring story, and I know others will too. Well, thank you both for the invitation to be on your podcast, and I really appreciate it. It's uh, been looking forward to this, and thank you for being a guest on mine. We've got a, a nice little exchange here. Yes, I love it. You know, that podcast started, all right, let me do some quick math. So it started almost 10 years ago. So I was in my early 50s when I started the Subconscious Mind Mastery podcast, and then Fun Astrology came six years later after the journey unfolded. But to walk back of why would you start telling a life story at 52, you know, because a lot of people say, ah, it's too late, right? It's too late to change. So we have to go all the way back because everything from childhood forward. And now, as I've seen through the lens of time and the the planets and the whole thing began with that I came here to do a, to make a transformational journey of my life. So the whole thing was baked in. Mm -hmm. And to begin that, and this is where astrology, and I don't, I know we're not going there too much here, but it just where the eyes and the lens of being able to use these configurations in the sky gets amazing because one of the things that I've been able to see through that very clearly was that it was not only about transformation, it was about spiritual or even religious transformation. So I was born into a very conservative fundamentalist family in Tulsa, Oklahoma, which is a definitely a Bible Belt community. And that was the only world we knew. It was church four days a week. We were in a Bible church, which is just a kind of a very neutral denomination for up until high school for me, really. A lot of teaching, a lot of learning about the Bible. I mean, I could, you know, have this tremendous Bible knowledge baked in. And then I wasn't allowed to go to a secular school, so I had to pick a Christian university. So I picked one with a good broadcasting department because that was my first love. And in the middle of college, I made a switch from intending to go to seminary to be a Baptist minister to broadcasting. 
And it worked <laughs> because my senior year of college, I was literally anchoring the news, the six and 10 news at an ABC television station in Fayetteville, Arkansas. But that, if I could just interrupt, that was a big step on your journey right there because your whole family and including some of your mentors were expecting you to go down this one path that was like going to be applauded and woohoo. And then you chose to go down a different path and you tell the story. Was it your minister who said, I'm so disappointed in your choices to well, not join? This is where the subconscious comes in. Exactly, Samantha. And that was so as I look back on that after time, I realized how powerful the subconscious mind was. So I did make a change. Everybody thought I was going to be a minister. I ended up in broadcasting and then I figured, and here again, the, the crazy little chart, you know, shows that you don't need to be working for anybody else. So I started my own business and I had a television production company in Dallas, Texas. Well, we were about, it was so three or four years after college. So I would have been in my mid twenties. We were all together up in Vail, Colorado, and my family loved going there for vacations back in the 70s and 80s. And my mom bumped into our minister from Tulsa walking around the streets of Vail. She comes in, she bursts through the doors of our little place where we would stay, and she said, you'll never believe who I saw. And it was him. And she said, we're going to have dinner with him tonight. So what a random chance meeting, right? Not so, random, not chance, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. That was that was a little uh, sarcasm there, a pun or whatever. But he, before dinner, he said, hey, come here, I want to talk to you. And we walked over and sat down on the bleachers of these tennis courts they had. And he looked straight at me and he says, you know, there have been two people since I've been a pastor for over 15 years. He said, There's, there are two people. There's a guy in Arkansas who had an affair with somebody in the choir and left the ministry. And then he points his finger right at me, like, you know, like just the finger right in the face. And he says, and you, you have been the biggest disappointment in my ministry. I can't believe that you didn't go to seminary. I, I can't believe you walked back on your commitment to go to into the ministry. Well, subconscious. Here was a guy that all through high school, those incredibly formative years that I looked up to, he was idolized. I wanted to be him. My really, I, you know, as a, again, here unpacked all of this. I really realized that my internal love, my soul was in love with the idea of broadcasting. That was the thing that I should have pursued. But this guy was so dynamic so winsome, so attractive to a crowd of people that there was something about that that was like, I could do that. I could be like that. And I was in love with the idea of spirituality. And again, that's wired into my, my DNA and was the very core of what I came here to transform, was to break free from the very thing that I wanted to go into. You see the irony of that? You see that pattern so many times that we have an interest in the very thing that we need to shift. That's so true. And that's so powerful. Well, I, I absolutely love that because you're talking about coming back to who you really came here to be. And I think that's what a lot of people are struggling with right now is they feel it in their heart. They feel this yearning. They've had the, the stepping stones along the way. So what would be some ways that people could use their subconscious? Because I mean, I, I love, love, love brain chemistry. And I, I know I talk about that a lot on the show, but just how when you start to use both hemispheres, that's when you can implement the changes in your life. That's when you can really step into it. And one last thing I tend to dart around a little bit is what, as you were speaking about the, the minister who was such a, a role model for you that I, I could sense this charismatic presence in your life. But in a sense, he was kind of a messenger to bring you to broadcasting because you mm -hmm. wanted to have that same impact with your work. So I just love how spirit works to say, you know what, we're lining all this stuff up for you. You just have to pay attention. So long story short, how, how can people tap more into their subconscious? Well, I'll tell you one of the key things to mm -hmm. that question is 
you have to recognize what's going on. You have to recognize the programming because that was such a key pivotal point in my life. And that's why I did my first subconscious mind mastery podcast, as Samantha mentioned, was that topic. Because as time unfolded, what he said, you are my biggest disappointment coming from a very influential, emotional person in my life. What did my subconscious instantly lock onto? You are a disappointment. And then that becomes like a running mantra, you know, throughout, you know, in, in our daily thoughts. I, and I feel like sometimes those inner mantras we're not even aware of consciously. Here's what happened with that. Basically, every time I looked in the mirror in the morning, subconscious was saying, you're a disappointment. So then what happens? You figure out a way to disappoint people without thinking, without any effort. See, that's where that seared into my soul. So the first thing that I think is so key is that we have to recognize what the programming is. So you talk about both hemispheres. What we're combining first is that we have to bring that subconscious into the conscious. We have to get it out here where we can look at it and work with it and hold it and formulate it. And that's what took me 30 more years, basically, to do because I lived an unconscious adult life. I just simply didn't know. Talk to us about Fred Dodson and how his work kind of triggered your path in many ways. So much of what happened in my journey happened intuitively. Even the story with the pastor, I mean, that stuff unfolded, but I had made an intuitive decision to switch. I would have been a terrible pastor if I had gone that route. So what happened is as a disappointment, as living the life of a disappointment, I ended up in two marriages and both failed. That second one was such a personal failure because people who are born into a Christian family in Tulsa, Oklahoma, don't get divorced once. Now I'm divorced twice. What in the world is going on here? What happened to me? And one of the best decisions I ever made is after that second divorce, I sat myself down for a year and looked at what is it about me that these people don't want to be with and started unpacking my life. And that's when I figured the, the disappointment piece out. Wow, that came back in full understanding. And I actually traveled back to Vail, back to that same spot so that I could complete that cycle. And that was an amazing experience to go back to that. The tennis courts that we sat at were gone, but actually there's, there are some private tennis courts right there by it. So I went to those, there aren't any bleachers there, but I sat on the ground under a tree and I literally for about two hours just openly and unapologetically bawled and let it all out and walked away from there complete that I am not a disappointment. All right, that was in 2009, and I spent a year unpacking everything. Well, started off on a new journey, learning about all this stuff that you guys talk about on your podcast, right? Started to implement it, need it, work it into my life, and started to make changes. Wow, this stuff works. Like I was living in a fifth wheel RV. I've always had this passion for travel. So here I was in this RV, and then it was time after that year, I said I was going to do it for a year. Well, it was time to sell the RV. I used all the tools to, to sell the RV, all the creating, manifesting, et cetera. And I mean, as smooth as clockwork, turned a Dodge 2500 diesel pickup truck <laughs> that I absolutely despised, turned that into a four-door, four-wheel drive Jeep Rubicon that I absolutely loved and sold the RV on Christmas Eve to a game warden. Wow. 
That is fantastic. You know, cause you always, that's one thing you do in your podcast is you don't just say like, Hey, here's how you do this. You give examples of how it worked in your own life, which I think is really, really helpful to people. Do you think that that pastor, like sometimes I look at negative people in my life and I don't mean to call him negative. Just what he said was pretty negative. And I yeah, feel like those yeah, people are, you know, really my greatest blessings and teachers in the moment. I don't think that, <laughs> but a couple of years down the road, I'm like, Oh yeah, that person was actually very helpful. I mean, do you think those people can act like signposts in our life, waking us up to our subconscious programming? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. He was in the sense that for my story to unfold, I had to fail. And I know that's, that's a hard pill to swallow right there. But I got to tell you, one of the things about looking back at life from your 50s and 60s is you start to see how it all clicked into place. And I had to go back and realize that those failures were the exact path that I came here in order to make these transformations. So absolutely key figure. You asked about Fred Dodson. What happened there is, so roll forward five years, from 20, oh, four, four years, from 2009, now 2013. I was getting ready to ride, to go on a bicycle ride. So I had all my, you know, bicycle garb stuff on and helmet, and I had my cleats on, and I was filling up my water bottles at the sink. Get the picture. I was out the door, right? Next thing, out to the garage and on the way. And while I'm filling up a water bottle, I mean, as clear as this sounds to you, email Fred Dodson about narrating his audiobooks. Well, I had wanted to get into audiobook narration. It was something I knew I could do. It was still fairly new back then. And I figured, hey, this would be a great way to make some money and put my voice out on something that would last forever, right? That would last for a long, long time. And those were the emotional things that made it appealing. How do you get started? Well, here comes this message. And I had been dabbling in it. I had some demo stuff. I had been to a training class in Los Angeles. So I had done a lot of the work to lay the groundwork, but I just didn't have the break. Well, when that voice came, I had learned enough and Denise, kind of back to your question, here's another piece of the question, is following the internal guidance into the new path. So, you know, you recognize the old, but you don't stay there. You move forward. And I think that was a big key of this is, is I unpacked for a year, but then I left that behind. And it was like, okay, I've got a whole new life to live. And I'm 52 or 51, 52 years old. I got a lot of work to do. But I figured, look, I, I counted my 20s, 30s, 40s, three decades, okay? Now I've got my 50s, 60s, and 70s. I better make every day count. And I better take care of this body so that I can get through the next. So I figured I was just at my midpoint. So here comes this prompt. I set the water bottles down and I went over to the computer. Fred Dodson to me at that point was an author that I had a book on my nightstand. And that was it. I was reading the book Levels of Energy at the time, which is sizzling with energy, by the way, as, as, as with this story. But I set the water bottles down. I thought, Fred Dodson, okay, that's that book that I'm reading. And I looked him up online in 2013. You know, what was there? Well, his website and there was his email at the bottom of the website. I'll be darned. So I put together a little demo. I typed up some things that I'd been doing in that area and I sent it off and then I went riding. So it probably took me about an hour, maybe an hour and a half that I delayed my ride, but I answered it in the moment. And the next morning, 5.30 in the morning, an email that changed my life, three words, let's do it. And so here appears the next person that you're talking about, this center of influence. And he became my mentor and friend and partner in these books and everything. And that was another incredible 
pivotal moment where my journey really began to take off. It wouldn't have happened if you hadn't started the work on your own and listened to that message and acted on it. That's that's key. You know, you've got to prime your subconscious to receive these messages. You've got to be willing to act on them when they come. And then you get those three word response. Let's do it. Let's go. It's, you know, this is your time. I love that. Yeah. It, and I'll tell you the thing that I you see and hear so many times, two big questions around intuitive prompts. People want to know, is this my monkey mind? Is this my chatterbox? Or is this truly a higher source impulse in my life? I'll tell you how I've analyzed that one. I was doing something else and it interrupted me. I was in no way focused on the topic of audiobooks. Fred Dodson was not on my mind. I was going on a bicycle ride and I was thinking probably about where am I going to go? And this thing comes from left field and it was so clearly audible that I knew that that was something I needed to take action on. So what most people do, so, so when you say, well, how do I know? That's one example that I would say, if you get one of those, lean into it because it came there to surprise you. It caught you off guard. So that's not your, your monkey mind thought process, linear conscious mind, left side of the brain kind of thing, right? That you're thinking thoughts about a particular topic. Yeah, it's just dropped in. It's like a gift from the universe. Just a little surprise. And it's asking, are you willing to take action on this, even though it sounds kind of crazy? So I did. Fred went on to say later that I happened to catch him at exactly the right moment. He said that so many things when people would write him as an author, as you will find out, people want to interact with you and they'll invite you into things. I heard a dynamic he actually, another pastor, not the same one, another dynamic pastor said that his secretary's most difficult or frequent task was politely, nicely saying no to things. And Fred said that most of the responses that he even then would reply was no. But for some reason, he said he intuitively felt to give this a try. Yeah. So I think the thing that Universe, source, God, however, whatever you call it, gives us these opportunities, these moments to literally shift. We have to do it. And the thing that I think is the other piece of intuition that where people get stuck is that they argue with it. Well, I can do it when I get back. Well, I don't, Fred Dodson, who is he? He's a nobody. I mean, he's just an author that I'm reading a book and you know, I kind of like his stuff, but I don't know. He, he wouldn't be interested in me. Oh, I'll never be able to find him. How could I find him in the world? You know, he's probably all private and got it. I don't even know if Fred Dodson's his real name. Maybe he's a, maybe that's a pen name or whatever, you know, and you start, but it, now there's the monkey mind, but instead you just do it. If anybody wanted just kind of a stat that would give you some motivation, and I know this is not a scientific number. But I'm going to say that 90, at least 90% of the time, if you follow intuition, it's going to work out well. And the 10% is the slop factor of the fact that we're going to get in the way of some of it, right? But if we just follow, if we followed intuition 10 out of 10 times, and we did and went the direction that it was pointing us, nine out of those 10 times, it's going to work out well. Totally agree. I like to trade the futures market and stocks periodically when I have time to look at it. And I'll tell you what, if I could make nine out of 10 of my trades positive, shoot, I wouldn't have to do anything else. Why wouldn't you exactly. when those things come up? And it did, it ended up being an incredibly pivotal point. And that was really when the subconscious growth, the understanding of the subconscious programming how much it truly does influence us. You know, the subconscious mind is an effortless piece of our spiritual composition that we don't have to do anything. It finds the way out there in front of us. It hits you. Here's the subconscious mind right back to that story. The subconscious knew that Fred was in a receptive mode for audiobooks. 
I didn't know that. The conscious mind can never know that. The subconscious knew that, and it knew to give me a little prompt at exactly the right time. And you can live your whole life like that. Mm -hmm. You can just be effortless. All you're doing is just, am I tuned in? Am I aligned? Exactly. You did the work, though, to get to that place. Because when you stood and looked yourself in the mirror, and I think as empaths, as sensitives, as intuitives, as whatever we want to put a category we want to put ourselves in, and that's the majority of our listening audience, we've all had a pastor in our lives. We've all had someone who has planted that seed. And then we spend decades of our lives trying to pull that taproot out to say, is that really who I am? Why am I letting this person's opinion of me define how I'm living my life? So even though you got to the, I love the the Fred Dodson part and trusting your intuition because you opened up to tap into that collective, but you also did the work prior to that to look at yourself and say, what is it in me? What is it in me that I have to release? And I think that's the hard part. That's the really, really hard part is to look yourself in the mirror and say, what what's my part in this? Because it's easy to deflect it. It's easy to say I'm a victim of circumstance or they did this or this happened to me. But when you look at the in the mirror and say, no, this is my shit and I need to own it, that's the catalyst for the change that you're talking about. And the way that you've described those beautiful stepping stones, but also that you did tap into your subconscious, tapping into that collective to say, get in touch with Fred now, or get in touch with this person now so that you're able to evolve into this next dimension of your life. And I think that's what you're talking about. And all of this is when you are able to pull out that taproot and start to trust your subconscious and your connection to divine, that's when you can make the changes so you can live your life that you came here to live, which is absolutely stunning and beautiful. So thank you for like putting out all of those little number line jumps for us because it it really shows the big picture. My, I guess my question with all of that would be how because you do, you have to pull out the root, you have to face that pastor in your life in order to get to the place to trust your subconscious enough to say, I have to deflect that. So what would be some skills? Because we can do the work, we can learn to trust, we can track our intuitive hits, we can do all of those things. But what was the, and I've, I've done ceremony, I, I have a spot that I don't need to disclose where you go and you just purge, you just purge all that pain and anger and fear and resentment and all those, that broil of stuff that you hold on to, how can people get from A to B? Because it's right, we're all on a timeline here as far as it's not if, it's when mm. that, that we check out. So not to be morbid, but anyway, that was kind of convoluted, but I think you're, it goes in a lot of different directions. And you know, with that, we all have our own story too. And mine is mine. I came to accept that. And one of the things that, so you have to get to answer your question directly. You have to get to the point of that analysis where the issue is big enough that you are willing to make dramatic changes in your life. And you know what people say is that, that you don't make changes until the pain of staying the way you are is greater than the pain of making the change because we are going into a deep, ugly, dark box. And one of the things that I've realized, oh my gosh, is that I would imagine you guys agree with me on this, but one of the big awakenings during that year that I was picking everything apart, I call it the year in the RV, 2009. I did the whole calendar year basically on my own, just out in the woods, kind of withdrawn from everything every day was me working on me and for it was actually the evenings because I was working a, a day job then in healthcare. I would come home and that would be the evenings is what I would do is. And I mean, I was um, I'm a Scorpio, so we do things kind of intensely. <laughs> we do things deeply. <laughs> we get to the bottom of it and I got to the bottom of it. But what I figured and I didn't think this, but now looking back on it, was the pain of staying in the, the way that I was being, I just decided, I was like, look, you're at the, say, the middle point of your life, you're at 50. And if you keep doing this, 
let's say the middle point of your adult life, if you keep doing this, it's just not worth going on. I do remember those thoughts very clearly. I was like, I'm not going to keep living like that. So I had to figure out what that was. Who made me, what made me the way I was? And one of the biggest discoveries during that was learning that it, a lot of it happens before we're born. <laughs> we think we just deal with our childhood and our, you know, our upbringing and our parents and our, okay, yeah, that's true. But there's more. And the example that became, again, here's something that became vivid in my own life later on was fear was always something that drove most of my behaviors and decisions. As a child, I could follow it all the way. Oh, this was a technique I used in 2009. Trace everything back as far as you can remember to where it originated in your life. Where did this first show up? Because then you can look at the circumstances around it that might have given you that subconscious program. Mom did something. Dad said something. You know, I was abused. That's a big one, obviously, that happens in childhood. All of these key areas. And then you look at how did that manifest? Well, fear was always there, and I never had an origination point. So I kept, and then how I found this was Darren Weissman. He was with Hay House at the time and on Hay House Radio. And I was listening to him, and he has this process that he would walk people back, and he would look into their subconscious programming before their birth. And he would look at, was this in the womb? Was this before the womb? Where did this originate? And that started, and remember, my context was Christian faith believes that you are born once to die, and after that, the judgment from the book of Hebrews. And my whole upbringing was, oh, no, that's of the devil. That's up in there with a straw. That's of the devil. <laughs> it's like, ah, that's of the devil. You don't like something, that's ah, of the devil. Wait, are you talking about looking at past lives? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Don't you think you, I don't want to get off on this tangent and I'm happy to delete this, but don't you think it was in the Bible and then Constantine, like, the, what was it, the Nicene Council kicked it it's out? It's absolutely in the Bible. Yes. Yeah. In fact, it showed up around Jesus when yeah. he was Mount of Transfiguration and the disciples were there with him and here they were glowing and there were two or three other people walking around with him. And they said, oh, that must be Moses. That must be Elijah. Elijah. Sure, they were thinking that. Yeah. And then they asked if Jesus was John the Baptist come again. Hello? Right, right? <laughs> All look right, at sorry, the, but look so at the you, Egypt, so... well, look at the Egyptian culture and look at Joseph. You know, the Egyptian culture was all about a journey that ends and then continues, right? And that's how Joseph was brought up after his brothers sold him into that culture. Sure. Talk about subconscious unprogramming there for poor Joseph, right? <laughs> he had more than a multicolored coat to switch out. Okay. So you're talking about past life stuff, which I think is fascinating because you don't you don't hear a lot about that in terms of subconscious programming. What did you learn about your past life subconscious programming. And I know that's like a book I'm asking you to answer, but if you could just kind of quickly summarize how that helped you. I think it comes forward. I think we bring it into this life. And that's one of the tenets of astrology as well. So when you start to learn the sky, the planets, the things above our head as a reflection, as above, so below, that it is baked into astrology. So it's something that you have to take a look at. If there's programming or resistance from a past belief system or a religious system. All I would say is just take a look, just be willing to take a look because fear was always there and I never could figure it out. Well, quick story through several past life regression sessions under either, eh, I don't know that I could ever be fully hypnotized. I've got way too much left brain going on for that, but at least enough to dig in I learned that there was a beheading in my past, that I was beheaded way back in the medieval period. Okay, sat with that. That's a bit of a shock. That didn't fix the problem. Still had the fear in every kind of degree, but I realized, wow. So if you step onto a planet where one of your exits was to have your head lopped off, how safe is anything? 
Well, what I then, I mean, and this was just happened on a walk, and it was another one of those downloads that just hits you. I'm thinking about other stuff. But fear had come in, and this was, and actually was in 2001. So I'd done all this work over all these years and all those audiobooks for Fred and all this stuff, and I had a fear-based reaction to something. So I was thinking, wow, how did that, you know, where did that, and on the walk, I did this little muscle testing thing that I do. I asked, is that related to that beheading? Yes, clearly, yes. Wow, okay, there must be more. I'm open to whatever you have to show me. If you want to show me something, I'm ready to clean this up. See, this is the shift, Denise, between the discovery phase, the analytical phase, and now you're working it. Now you're dialoguing with your higher self to say, hey, what, is, what do you have to show me? Let's go to work. I'm ready. And what it showed me was that I was beheaded face up without any face covering. And I could actually see the axe coming down. And I don't mean to be graphic, but all I want to say is get the picture of bringing that a thousand years forward. How many lifetimes was that? At least a thousand years. And that fear was always there. And finally, it came to this time and place to be dealt with. Why? I'll tell you why I think it was. Because in the year 2000, in January, on January 12th, two planets aligned in the sky, Saturn and Pluto, in the sign of Capricorn in our tropical zodiac. That doesn't happen but every 200, at least 250 years, because it takes Pluto that long to go all the way around. And if you trace it back, it is a very powerful, epic, shifting alignment in the sky. And I think that it is realigning so many things in our world now. And if you look back, what happened two weeks after, in the end of January, first part of February of 2000, all of a sudden we have a worldwide pandemic. I was like, oh, so that's how we're going to play this. Well, under that alignment, I finally saw the source of my fear. And I will tell you this, what was amazing is that when I saw it and I understood it, yeah, look, I'm a water sign. I cry <laughs> still at this old age, but I wept for a few minutes in the shock of it. And it was really more empathy than anything else. It was like, wow, your soul, you poor soul, you've been dragging this along that for all those years, all that time. But the shift was instant because once I saw it, oh, well, no frickin' wonder. Hello. And I just instantly saw, well, yeah, this place isn't safe. Well, it doesn't have to be this time. And I just was able to release it. And I will tell you that fear, even with everything crazy that's going on in the world right now, I don't have any fear with it, about it. It's like, it's going to work out how it works out. This will be what it is, but it's not what that was. And it resolved just instantly. It fell off. So again, that's my path, not everybody's. But I would say that one of the things, if you're stuck in some area, that there is very likely something that was not attached to just this incarnation that you probably should go back and take a look at and see if you can unwrap and, and just ask. I mean, ask. So you've got an area, anger. Let's pick anger. Anger is a big one, right? People say, you know, I just can't. I just always, oh, I have these reactions and I'm, I can't. Oh, I just try so hard, but I can't. Well, ask. Where did this come from? Trace it back. When did it first show up? Okay, that's what you can work with in this lifetime. That's what you can analyze. That's what your left brain can see and feel and dissect. When did it first show up? What triggers it? Do all of that part of the process. And if you're still stuck, simply ask, what else can I open up here? What else is there to show me? I think I'm ready. If I'm not, what do I need to do to get ready? And then be benefic, be nice, be kind, but lay it on me because I'm ready to change. 
I'm ready to change. I don't want this to be part of me for the rest of my life. Because I facilitate past life regressions with people. Did you find out why you were beheaded? I've, I haven't in a past life regression, but what has come just intuitively. So I've asked, and that's a great question. Was this part of, was this something I did or was this something that happened to me? No, it was not something that I did. So it wasn't a crime. I wasn't paying for something. What I got to was that I had something that somebody else wanted. And what that did was like land or property or a wife or something. I don't know. But whatever it was even added to the unsafeness because I was I knew in my heart that I was not guilty of something. So you can get your head lopped off on this place for anything. <laughs> 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 that is so true. And maybe if you're lucky, remember, I remember reading King Henry VIII, his big act of kindness to Anne Boleyn was that he made the executioner use a very new sharp blade. Like, gee, thanks, Henry. Yeah. Nice. Okay, so I've been reading a lot of, I don't know, I read a lot of history books in, for fun. And, and so I've been doing this little dive into the workhouses, um, especially in England around Dickinsonian times. And it just made me think how much we must carry subconsciously from past lives, from generational karma, this whole fear of lack. You know, I, it just made me think like, gosh, we haven't had social security or welfare, not even for a hundred years in our, in our own country. It, it's all relatively new. This idea of, for the most part, there are resources for you when things fall apart, right? And so Absolutely. that there must be this energy that we're all kind of swimming and marinating in of lack. And, and I was just wondering if we could segue that into your work and your new book coming up about manifesting more abundance and financial resources. That's a great question. All you've been to Western North Carolina, right? This yeah. place is covered with trees. I mean, there's an abundance of everything in the world here. There are pastures for cattle and livestock and crops, and there are trees for lumber, and there's beautiful fresh air, the Smoky Mountains, right? That's the organic compound coming out, up, out of the trees. Water bubbles out of the ground. I mean, there's nothing like this place. It oozes abundance. In fact, it's kind of interesting. Uh, Paige Bryant is an author who's gone now, but she wrote a book called the the uh, Great Awake or the the uh, Spiritual Awakening of the Great Smoky Mountains. And it's hard to find. It's it's out of print and it's hard to find. But she talked about these mountains opening up when the Cherokee fled to the mountains to avoid Andrew Jackson's army who was going to relocate them. And there was a whole new tribe of Cherokee that was birthed, who survived the Trail of Tears by fleeing into these mountains and living off of their abundance. So there is abundance everywhere. And I mean, it's just so cool to be living. It's a reminder every day. You know, you go out here and you say, so the planet itself, the physical planet Earth itself oozes abundance when it's in its natural state. It's us that mess it up. We take the abundance away from the earth. Well, that's baked into our culture. It's baked into our lives. It probably was baked into your parents' lives. They taught you to be less than abundant, right? Oh, money is so hard to earn. Money is so hard to come by. It goes through your finger. If, you if you're lucky enough to get it, it just goes through your fingers like sand. And then the government's gonna come take it all away, right? So we're all programmed culturally, environmentally, everything to think that there's not enough. So the big shift is that you start to adopt that, well, okay, let's say that there was no more money anywhere in the world. It was all gone. The pattern of how the universe works, how earth works is there would be <laughs> this is not talking about government printing presses here. There would be more created or there would be another way to exchange that would be equal to and even better than money. 
bartering. I don't know. You know, some kind of new way of exchanging the value and services that we need would be created. If all you did was just shift into the mindset that if what I need is a job and there are no, I can't find a job in my field. I can't find anybody that will hire me. If you go in with that mentality, then you're absolutely right. And you won't. But if you go in with the mentality that if there's not one job in this town where I live, then one will be created for me, then you can find that job. And that is a consistent pattern that just shows up time and time again. It's a mindset change. And this is one of the things that Fred has really helped me with because Fred lives in an abundant earth, total all the time mentality to the point that I've learned over the last almost 10 years now that I've worked with him. Don't even bring anything up that's counter to that. He doesn't want to hear it and I don't want to express it. Yeah, but no, uh, uh, uh. don't even think that way. There is a way, there is a solution. Right now, as we're recording this, the stock market is going down. It's been going down most of this year, 2022. People make money faster in a down stock market than you can in an up market. You just get, you buy different stuff. And there are plenty of ways that you can make money on the way down. They say bulls take the stairs, bears fall out the windows. <laughs> it's faster. <laughs> so the point is, it doesn't matter what the environment is around you. Oh, the market's crashing. My, my 401k is going to nothing. Well, you should have shifted that thing to something else, you know. So it's just constantly that you're looking for and seeking and pursuing, but with the full belief in the magic of this world, <laughs> this is this is like crazy. If something isn't there, it will be created for you. Try living like that and see what kind of a difference it makes. It's amazing. Yeah, I also think it's important to focus on why you're trying to create what you're trying to create. You know, like I have so many friends and no judgment, but they're only working for retirement. They hate their jobs. They're not fans of their coworkers. It's, they're very stressed out. They work all the time. And some of them are like counting the years and days to their retirement. And I don't know. I just think that's not what money should be all about. And, and there is honor in providing for your family and all of that. I'm not saying that. But I just, I just always think about what my dad taught me. He used to always say, Samantha, why do I work? To make money. Why do I make money? To spend it. <laughs> that philosophy <laughs> served him really well his whole life. Like he always had plenty of money. He always made money. He always, he never had to worry about it. And I think it's because he had that idea of, you know, it's just a piece of paper, a commodity. And when we, when we tie all this reason and purpose and pressure and retirement, and I don't know, once I took, for me personally, once I took retirement off the table, right? Like, okay, I'm not going to retire. Like, first of all, I don't want nothing about retiring appeals to me. Once I took that off the table, my whole attitude about money and earning shifted. And it was more about what can I contribute? What can I give? What can I share? And that helped my money worries tremendously. I've used Bob Proctor as a role model in that very area. You know, he died recently, earlier this year. You didn't know was, that. Yeah, he was 87. And um, he had a heart valve replacement about 10 years ago. And I think that those are good for about 10 years. And probably it was a heart related thing. He had started to really decline in the fall of last year. He never retired. Could have had all the money he needed. Didn't have to work for money. His family was provided for. His needs were certainly provided for. But he worked until he couldn't be public anymore, basically. That's what I want to do. And yeah. he worked helping people reframe and reprogram their subconscious mind. He helped them with their, as he called it, paradigm. So he was giving and he was telling his life story and doing his work until 
he couldn't do it anymore. Paul Harvey, one of my broadcast men. I love Paul Harvey. His last broadcast was two weeks before he died of pneumonia. Wow. Okay. As an aside, I have two of his books. I can't find his The Rest of the Story on any podcast anywhere. Hasn't they, anyone put that together? Copyright. They, there was wow. somebody that had it and the family pulled it. Okay. Just wondering because well, I used to love listening to that. Supposedly, Paul Jr. was going to revive it, but he hasn't. If you, that was kind of a sad thing because I found the address. I mean, I love Paul Harvey. We were, he was born in Tulsa, where I was born. Oh. I found the address of the home that he, where he uh, had his Phoenix headquarters, his summer home or his winter home. I mean, the place was dilapidated. The gate was falling down. It was rusted out. That is just not properly cared for, and that would have been his you know, fell to his son. So I don't know. I, I have no idea what's going on there. Well, I'm going to hope that you're getting ready for another bike ride. And a voice says to you, email Paul Harvey's family. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. I know. I know. I wish it, I wish it could be, but we had talked about desire and resistance. Can we just spend a quick second oh, on that? Yes. Thank you. This Have is, nice. I think of all the lessons that Fred Dodson, he has tons of examples and exercises of things in his books. This one is the top one for me. So basically we live between two worlds and this is so subconscious programming too, because we're doing this all the time, every day, and we don't know it. It's off our conscious radar most of the time that it happens. We either desire something really, really strongly, <laughs> like I want this or I want that, or, I, or the opposite. We resist things strongly. So if you, for example, draw a line horizontally just in your mind, and put zero at the midpoint of this horizontal line. And over on the right side, put desire. And over on the left side, put resistance. Okay. Now, if you desire something, so, so this is the exercise is whenever anything comes up that is in front of you, you instantly think, where am I on the desire resistance scale? So you think about, you know, I want a new job. We were talking about that. Oh, if I could only get this job, this is the perfect job. This is the dream job. And all you're focused on is I've got to get this job. I have to look good for the interview. How can I make my resume better? Because I really need to get past the, the wall of maybe who do I know that works there that could walk me in? Cause I have to get this job and think about that on a scale of one to 10. How badly do you desire that particular outcome? No, oh, 10, you know, eight, whatever it is. I want this so bad in my life. All right. Now let's think about the other, like you were saying, oh, I can't stand my job. I can't wait to retire. I've got three years, tw eight months, 27 days and four hours <laughs> until I'm out of here. Right. I mean, you're just, you're, oh, uh, now we've got this meeting that I have to do at 11 o'clock. Oh, I just can't stand even the thought of getting on there, blah, blah, blah. And you're resisting it. Um, for me, it was traffic in Dallas, Texas, where I'd lived for over 30 years. Traffic, oh, horrible, ah, I can't stand it. honk, you know, <laughs> all that. Resisting, I'll never get out of here. I'll never be able to leave this town. I'll never escape this place. And all it is is just one big concrete jungle full of traffic. Resistance, what is that? 10. Well, whenever you desire something too much, whenever you resist something too much, the universe has zero room to work on your behalf because you've got the reins of the whole thing. And like I said, this is subconscious programming 101, 201, 301, because it really happens off. If you go through the day and you could capture all of your strong desire or strong resistance thoughts and analyze them at the end of the day, you would be amazed and how many showed up? Wow, really? I have that many. And if they were automatically scaled out by, by the universe to say, here are how they all fell on the scale. You're like, man, I am a resisting machine. Or wow, I've got all these things that I want 
That means I don't have them. So that means there is lack because I don't experience them in my life. So all I'm doing is wanting stuff I don't have. Well, where the universe works is closer to that zero point that we set up in the middle. So if you just think, go over to two toward desire, go over to two toward resistance. It's not that we're a machine. It's not like we're like Mr. Spock on Star Trek, you know, no emotions whatsoever. Of course we have desires. Of course we have resistance. We acknowledge that, but it, we keep it contained to a little bit. It would be nice if this job came about, but if this one doesn't, there's plenty of others. And then that would have been a bad job for me if I'm not led that way anyway. This new car. Oh, wow. That would be really cool. I would look really good in that car. But, you know, it could also get me in an accident or it could get stolen or, you know, whatever. It might be a 2022. It doesn't have any parts in it. <laughs> it's not going to work. Whatever. I, if I get that car, okay, I'll pursue that car, but I don't have to have it. Resistance. I'll tell you what I got to. I finally got to a point where I accepted Dallas as my home. I, this is the place where I seem to be. I've tried a number of times to leave. And if I live here and work here and my family's here and et cetera, then this is it. I'm going to make it okay. I'm going to make it the very best I can make it. And within six months of that decision, I was living in Aspen, Colorado. <laughs> that was what you call an upgrade. <laughs> What you do is you just, you bring that desire and resistance into that narrow box of a little bit either way, and that's where the universe can work its magic. See, that's beautiful. And that's why we need to have you back on to talk about surrender and acceptance, because I feel like that's in the same vein. And I know we had emailed about talking about that and so many other things that we didn't get to. So will you come back on the show? Anytime. Okay, great. And I just want to add that I knew I was on my way with my spiritually awakened journey when my road rage dissipated because that was desire, resistance and surrender and acceptance. And once I was like, okay, I live in a much smaller little coastal town now where people just aren't in a rush like they are up North and I need to surrender and accept this it took me about eight years, but I learned it. And I'm so happy <laughs> that I did. It's amazing. These ingrained patterns are tough to, to weed out, but once they do, it completely changes everything. And it's lasting. Totally. If you're totally committed lasting. to it. Yeah. Exactly. If you're real, you, the whole thing about this conversation is you have to be real with yourself. You're the one looking that person in the eyes, in the mirror, in the morning, first thing. What's real? there. No pretension, not trying to appease your partner if you have one or the world or your co-workers or your kids. It's what's real with you, to you. Are you being authentic? That's the bottom line. That's something I meditate on a lot. What is true about me in this moment? What is true? And that that's very, very helpful. What you're saying is allow the universe to bring in more than you may even expect. And by being authentic to yourself, you're not wasting your turn. And that's what I see a lot, like a lot of our, our people that listen a lot, Samantha and I have talked about this extensively. We have this shot to really step into our power, light and our purpose. And I think that's this transition that we're all in right now. And that's what you're exemplifying with your work. So thank you. Thank you very much for everything you've shared. Oh, thank you. This is a highly transformative time. It is the best time to be on the planet. Is it going to be the easiest? No, probably not. What's ahead of us might be a little bit difficult, might be a lot difficult. We don't know at this point where we're recording this. But what we do know is that we are at one of those major historic shift points. And this is a time that we can all shed stuff from the past and we can reprogram and take on the whole thing to me now, and especially from this perspective of life, what groundwork am I laying for my future incarnations? Who am I going to be when I come back? I don't want any baggage. I, that little knapsack that we dragged in here, I want mine empty. <laughs> <laughs> and we've got the energy to do it under this Saturn and Pluto conjunction. I think we've got the 
absolute opportunity to empty our knapsack. And I think you're still a minister in many ways. <laughs> oh, thank you're you. You're ministering to, to all of your people. I mean, isn't it funny the way it all comes full circle? Tell people where they can they can hear both of your podcasts and connect with you. Oh, sure. A subconscious mind mastery is the one that was started in 2013. And then Fun Astrology is a daily podcast where we look at the configurations up in the sky just to catch the energy. It's kind of like a daily Paul Carvey report of the sky, of what's going on energetically. That's fantastic. Thank you so much for joining us. And we look forward to having you back on the show. And thank you, everyone, for listening. Please remember, as always, to show up, do great work, and share your light. Take care.